Hello, in this video I want to show you a Christmas present that I got from my wife which she got for me this year, breaking the budget. We don't have a lot of money so I was pretty surprised when I opened up this big box next to the Christmas tree and it had this telescope in it. Uh, this telescope is the Celestron 114AZSR. I believe the SR means that you've got some sort of smartphone mount on it. I think that's what the SR stands for, I could be wrong with that. And AZ means it's got some sort of azimuth um, control on it. And the 114 refers to the size of the aperture on the front. Now this telescope is a Newtonian reflecting telescope. This one has a spherical mirror on the back and you place a lens here. There's a mirror inside it which I'll show you in a bit. I've had some experiences with this telescope now. I've been out and I've looked at some stars and the moon and it's got some plus points, it's got some negative points. It is a beginner's telescope. It is not the sort of thing that someone who's been sky watching for decades is going to really enjoy very much. But for someone who's never had a telescope before, like me, this is a wonderful present to get. It's more than just a toy telescope, but it's not as expensive as some of those more advanced models. It's got things like a viewing scope at the top, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, it's got <coughs> a few different lenses that it comes with, although, to be honest with you, there's only one lens that's any good with this, the other one's not very good. Um, it doesn't have a carry case, which is a bit of a nuisance, walking out into a field with this thing all open rather than taking it apart. And the biggest problem with this telescope is that the mount here is not very stable. It wobbles an awful lot when there's wind. You see, wind affects viewing conditions in other ways as well. For example, if it's very windy, you're going to get more um, shivering of stars in the sky, that sort of thing. It makes it more difficult to make your observations. And using the smartphone mount in order to take photographs of stars when it's windy, you forget about it. They're shimmering around so much that there's no point taking the photographs. It's okay even in windy conditions looking at the moon. And I've taken some photographs of stars and the Orion Nebula. My first attempt at the Orion Nebula, be gentle, it's not perfect, I will try it again. Um, but I took those pictures using this on a fairly still day. It should be a nice quiet night tonight. It doesn't look too windy out there at the moment. Um, and the sky looks clear, so I'm going to see what I can take tonight with this telescope as well. It's quite exciting. I'll take my daughter out with me. She loves using the telescope to look at the moon, but then she gets a bit impatient when I start looking at stars because to her they all look the same. Now I wanted as large an aperture as possible on a telescope, so I was quite happy that my wife got me a reflecting telescope with an 11.4 centimetre aperture on the end, 114 millimetre aperture on the end. The larger the aperture, the more light that you can get into the telescope, and so the fainter the objects that you can visualise. This aperture is pretty good for viewing the moon, it's also okay for viewing some of those more obvious uh, Messier objects that you might see in the sky. The telescope itself comes with this um, cover. I don't know what you call this thing, a cover. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, you put cap, lens cap, but it's not a lens, so I don't know. A cover that goes over the end here. And this cover comes in two parts. I think the reason for that is that if you're viewing something like the moon, which you know, reflects a tremendous amount of light, you can use this cover to... Uh, attenuate a lot of the light that gets in but still allow enough light to get in for you to take your photographs. I think, I think that's what it's for. <clears throat> We've also got a cover on this lens bit here as well which I'll take off, I don't need that for the moment. The tripod for the telescope has this little uh, table thing here with some round circles on it. If I just unscrew this very quickly I'll show you it. So you can see it's got these circular parts here. I think the idea of this is that you could place uh, things into this and it will hold them, nice blue background so you can see it, and it will hold them in place when you're doing your observations. So if you have many lenses, many different lenses that you want to use, then you can keep them all on that tripod and they should be easier to access. Now, the telescope didn't come with a pack with all the lenses and other accessories in. So I've just popped them in this clear plastic uh, wallet thing, this little, uh, I can't remember what this was for, one of my daughter's toys I think. It's transparent which makes it easier to find things when it's very very dark and you'll find things in here 
that I imagine are familiar to people that are used to looking at the skies at night, for example, uh, <laughs> a red light, if I put this on, okay, it's a torch, it's what you get on the, um, on the back of my bike, it's a bike light, but it's red, which means it should help preserve my dark adapted vision while I'm out there. Of course, as soon as I start using the smartphone, my dark adapted vision is shot because the smartphone screen emits all sorts of colours. So this thing here is the smartphone mount, which works really well. I I'm using my smartphone to record this, so I can't actually show how my smartphone fits into the smartphone mount. Uh, but you can you see it's got these rubber bungee parts here. And it, it does, it actually holds the phone pretty comfortably in there. The telescope also comes with two lenses. And these two lenses are here. One is a 9.7 millimeter lens, and the other one is a 26 millimeter lens. And I found very little success with the 9.7 millimeter lens. I think it's a little bit ambitious. The 9.7 millimeter lens should produce a far greater magnification of the image. The problem with it is, uh, the viewing angle in the sky is so small that the stars and any planets you're observing move across your vision so quickly. And the tripod wobbles whenever you touch it. So by the time you've got it lined up, pointing at what you want to look at, and you're happy and you're going to start taking photographs, unfortunately the thing you're looking at has moved. So I haven't had much luck with the 97 millimeter lens. Uh, I'm going to pop that under here because you can see the lenses sit quite nicely on that little table there. So I'm going to set this up with the uh, with the 26 millimeter lens, which you can see here. And the 26 millimeter lens uh, fits in, I think, in the same way as most lenses fit into these um, into these telescopes. You can see here is the uh, hole where you're going to put the eyepiece lens, just like this. It just slots in. Just make sure I loosen these two screws here. It just slots in just like that. And then I can tighten those screws up to hold it in place. Not too tight because I don't want to scratch up the, the metal housing of the lens. But there we go. So the lens is now on the side there. And I'll take my lens cap off. Uh, my, it's not a lens cap, is it? I don't know what I'd call that. Some sort of cap off the end there. And there we have it. So now viewing into here and adjusting the focus with these dials here makes a very satisfying crunching noise because of all the various oil they've used to lubricate this thread here. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but it's quite easy to focus with this particular lens. It's quite easy to focus on the moon, for example. It's got two uh, nuts here and here, which you can loosen, which makes it easier to adjust the angle of this thing, or you can tighten them. The thing is, if you tighten them too tightly, then it's more difficult to change the angle. And there's no point thinking, and this is my experience, there's no point thinking, well, I'll have them loose, I'll point it at what I want to look at, then I'll tighten them. Because as you tighten them, the whole thing is moving, which makes it impossible to keep it pointing at what you want to look at. So I tend to keep these, you know, not too tight, but reasonably loose. And then this thing here is supposed to allow you some fine control, but only the, um, only the declination, not the right ascension. There's no fine control of right ascension with this telescope. So you put it on the ground, you get it roughly pointed at what you want to point it at, then you tighten this nut here. And now, if you want to adjust the uh, declination, you turn this thing here, and you can see the telescope is moving up and down it has some fine control there. So how do you point it at the thing you want to point it at? Well, you've got this viewing um, scope here. And I, I had all sorts of problems getting this viewing scope lined up. And in the end, I lined it up during the daytime, pointing out of my window at a kite that's stuck in a tree on the other end of a field. It's about 200 metres away, maybe not quite as far as that. I lined up the middle of the eyepiece, when well, looking through the eyepiece, got it focused on the middle of that kite, and then I adjusted using two screws. There's one here, and there's one um, on the bottom here. So this screw here, and this screw uh, here. And I used those two screws to adjust uh, the, uh, the viewing scope so it was pointing in the right place. 
To turn the viewing scope on, you can hear that click when I turned this dial, there's a dial here. And I couldn't find any real instructions for this viewing scope. I had to figure this out myself. These two screws, let's move this down. These two screws are for adjusting the position of the viewing scope. And this one was for turning it on and making the dot brighter or, or dimmer. Now the viewing scope itself is a red dot. And it seems that my red dot takes some time to warm up. I don't know if that's normal, but my red dot takes some time to warm up, it seems. Because a few times where I've been out, I've thought, where's my red dot? Oh, it's run out of batteries, it's not working, did I leave it on? And it turns out I haven't left it on, because after a little while of waiting, a red dot appears in this uh, viewing scope here. And I'll show you down the viewing scope when the red dot has warmed up. I don't know if this is the correct way to use this telescope or not, but this is how I use it. I look at the object in the sky that I want to see. I <laughs> grab the bottom of it, trying hard not to touch these parts in the bottom, which would affect the alignment of the mirror. I haven't had to align the mirror yet. And fingers crossed it's going to be a while until I have to. Uh, <clears throat> but then what I'll do is I'll look through the scope at the red dot, and I'll line the red dot up with what I'm trying to look at. Now, if you look, when I let go, you see, it moves. So it's a bit of a nuisance. But if you tighten that nut, it doesn't move anywhere near as much. And indeed, this nut here, this is pretty loose here. But as long as you're happy, you've got it kind of in the right place. Maybe this is why it's better with the 26mm eyepiece. Um, because that little bit of movement does not as important. You can still see what you're looking at. My red dot still hasn't warmed up, so I'll wait a bit longer. So I move it around until the red dot is pointing at the thing I want to look at. <clears throat> then, without touching anything, I walk around and look into the eyepiece. If I knock it a little bit, the thing I'm looking at is not in the centre of my image anymore. Well, I've just discovered it's not that it's taken the dot a while to warm up, which I thought it was because it seemed to spontaneously work. The dial itself seems a little bit temperamental. It's not great. So I'm going to go out tonight with this and I'm going to see what I can do. I'm going to see what I can see. I'm going to try to take lots and lots of photographs of the same thing. I don't know what that is yet. I'll go and have a look and see what that is. But try and take lots and lots of photographs of the same thing. The idea being that I will then be able to stack those photographs on top of each other. And some very clever software will see the noise from the pictures and be able to pick that out from what little light there is that's coming from the stars and other objects that are just too faint for us to see with the naked eye. That software should be able to pick out what signal from what's noise if it has enough data. So if I have enough photographs all taken pointing at the same patch of the sky, it can rotate and stack those images to produce a far better quality image in the end. Well, we'll see what it looks like. Maybe I'll put a slideshow of those pictures at the end of this video. So I don't know how well this video is going to turn out. I think it might be a little bit on the dark side. Um, but we're, I'm out in a field. My daughter didn't want to come out in the end. A little bit disappointing. She didn't want to come out and take some photos with me tonight. So I'm out here by myself. Where am I? I'm in a field. It's very, very dark. Not much around. But if you look over my shoulder, you'll see there's quite a bright thing. That's the moon. It's a very, very bright full moon, and that's going to make it... There it is, just over my shoulder. That's going to make it quite difficult to get any decent pictures of stars tonight. Very still, there's no wind. I can hear ducks making noises over there. And, um, you know, generally quacking away. Uh, I can see a few stars. I mean, you won't be able to see them in this camera here. Maybe you can see a couple of them because I've got the brightness on full. But I can see a few stars. Uh, I'm down low enough that the sea wall is blocking most of the glow from Kent, from all the industrial works at Kent, where I am right now in Shoebury on Gunners Park. Um, so it's pretty dark. There's an estate just over here, which is a bit of a source of light. But I'm some way away from it. Um, this is about as good as I'm going to get, to be honest with you, in terms of darkness. But that moon, that moon is going to be the one that stops me from getting any decent pictures. But we'll see. So shall we start by getting ourselves lined up and taking photos of the moon? And then we'll take it from there. 
there's so much light it might be possible to make out the telescope just by the light of the moon although I don't know it seems to be struggling a bit there's the moon right there let's take it as a picture I mean failing that I've got my torch my red torch um, which you might be able to see just about here making out the telescope in the dark I'm probably covering the microphone with my hand while I'm doing this so let's get this red dot turned on